So today um, we are super excited to have Dr. John Baugh with us. Uh, he is a Margaret Bush Wilson Professor in Arts and Sciences, Sciences at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he attended Temple University as an undergraduate majoring in speech, rhetoric and communication and received his MA and PhD in linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he is best known for formulating the concept of linguistic profiling and has conducted research on that topic in the US, Brazil, the Caribbean, England, France, and South Africa. And most of his research is devoted to finding ways to use linguistic science to advance equality and to improve the human condition globally. Uh, his most recent book is titled Linguistics in Pursuit of Justice. Uh, and interestingly enough, I actually spoke with our uh, chair of linguistics here uh, at uh, UC San Diego, and he mentioned that we actually have courses, uh, linguistics courses at UC San Diego that were based on Dr. Baugh's work. So Dr. Baugh, uh, uh, in one minute, I'll turn it over to you, but I just wanted to mention that uh, we'll take questions at the end, but if you have any questions that you would like to send to either Edward or myself, please feel free to do so in the chat. All right, Dr. Ball. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And um, I'm gonna talk for maybe around 40 minutes and then we can open up the discussion after that. I'm gonna begin by sharing my screen. Um, and when this presentation was uh, uh, first put together and I saw that it was hosted by the design lab at San Diego State, I uh, immediately tried to think of clever ways that the linguistic work on discrimination might fit into a discussion about design. And then it dawned on me that if I used a hyphen and thought of languages as being composed of signs, that the de-signing of minority linguistic groups might be a way to think about introducing this subject. Uh, hopefully that will prove to be the case. So I'd like to acknowledge my uh, sponsors throughout the years. Um, I was very fortunate to receive uh, extensive support from the Ford Foundation throughout my career. Um, they were kind enough to provide funding for me to attend graduate school. They supported 10 years of research on linguistic profiling, five within the United States, another five internationally. Um, you can see the other uh, federal foundations as well as uh, some private foundations that have been very generous to me throughout the years and I wanted to acknowledge that. But I also wanted to thank my sponsors today and the faculty members from the design lab who were kind enough to reach out and ask me to participate in the discussion today. Uh, I wanna give a special shout out to my colleague from graduate school, Anaceria Zentea, who is a retired professor of ethnic studies at UC San Diego. Um, she and I were, you know, very close friends in graduate school and then through throughout the rest of our lives. Um, some linguists may remember the ascendancy of US English through the efforts to try to promote English as an official language within the United States. And very often Anaceria and I would be on the circuit together uh, debating Stanley Diamond and other proponents of that. And um, she is a, a cherished friend and um, a lot of her work on bilingual issues within the United States have, ha have uh, inspired a great deal of the work that I do. So I wanna acknowledge her and thank her very much for all of the support and friendship she's given me through the years. So I'm gonna begin on a personal note, um, because my linguistic journey began uh, in Los Angeles and Philadelphia. I was born in Brooklyn, New York, when my dad was going to Pratt 
after the GI Bill. And we moved to Philadelphia until I was about six years old. And from there, we moved to Los Angeles. And initially, I attended an inner city school. And this is a picture of me with my classmates. And you'll see that the only European American is our teacher. There are no European American students. Uh, the mixture of African American students and students of Chinese and Japanese descent uh, was a reflection of the neighborhood at that time. We lived not that far from the University of Southern California. So if you know the Los Angeles area, back in 1958, when this picture was taken, um, we lived in a minority community, but a racially diverse minority community where many of my classmates were learning English as a second language. And many of my fellow African-American classmates were speakers of what linguists now call African-American vernacular English. I had the special benefit of uh, parents who were both college educated. My mother was an elementary school teacher and my father who had once worked for RCA in Camden, New Jersey, took a job with Hughes Aircraft Company where he spent most of his career. And because they were successful, they made a decision in 1959 to move to the San Fernando Valley. And my exposure to a different set of linguistic circumstances took place there. And so this is the following year, 1959. There are no students of color with the exception of me. And in the age of Barack Obama, it's important for this audience to know that I'm not biracial. Obviously I have white blood, but the white blood in my family came into the family so long ago that I have no idea who my white ancestors are on either side of the family. So my father's side of the family, as well as my mother's side of the family, um, tried very much to trace the ancestry, but they only got far enough back to discover that female slaves had been impregnated by white slave owners, and we weren't able to trace the family beyond that. So uh, many people that look like me have a, an immediate biracial ancestry. I do not. The racial mixing in my family goes so far back that I actually have a very strong African-American identity that I'm proud of. And you'll learn more about that as we move through the presentation. So I'm gonna give you a chance to look at this abstract yourself. I'll be discussing the linguistic legacy of the African slave trade, but I also wanna call attention to Anacelia's work uh, where the expression TWB, talking while bilingual, grows out of outstanding studies that she did looking at linguistic discrimination on the job against Spanish speakers who were penalized for speaking Spanish uh, by employers that wanted to create English only workplaces, even though the use of Spanish was not problematic in any way. And I'm not just mentioning Anacelia in the context of this lecture because she taught at UCSD. Uh, her work is of value to me everywhere I go in the world. So um, that's, it's just a coincidence and a happy one that uh, she's at UCSD. And so before I begin, I realize that there's a lot of folks on the Zoom that are not linguist and don't have a background in linguistics. And so I'd like to begin by at least sharing my elevator speech definition of what linguistics is. So linguistics is the science that tries to determine what all human languages have in common and we're very fortunate today because you actually have a sign language interpreter who is providing 
insight into another linguistic modality other than my talking, right? So languages don't have to be conveyed through your voice, but linguistic systems are equally complex, whether they're spoken or assigned. And what you see in red is phonetic transcription. Even if you've never been exposed to phonetic transcription previously, you can see how linguists would write what is linguistics in phonetic transcription. And that particular tool is extremely beneficial in our science because it provides an opportunity to write down any human utterance, either in a language that's known or a language that's not known. And for languages that don't yet have writing systems, thanks to the phonetic alphabet, we can provide that. But I'd also like to pay tribute at this point to some of the founding figures in linguistics. A lot of people may not remember that today is actually International Holocaust Remembrance Day. On January 27th, 1945, Auschwitz was liberated and that transformed the world. But those, especially those who are linguists, will recognize that many of the pioneers in the field were um, Jewish in their heritage. And so I've listed uh, also, I don't know, is, is it, can you see my entire screen or is the right side blocked off with other images? The right Perfect. side is blocked off. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Okay, Perfect. can you see all of that now? Perfect. Okay, all right, so let's go back. So you can see that whole image now, right? Okay, good. So pioneers in linguistics, starting in the upper left, you have Franz Boas, moving to the right on the upper level, Edward Sapir, Leonard Bloomfield, Roman Jakobsen, next row down, Joseph Greenberg, uh, Joshua Fishman is right in the middle, and another sociologist, Irving Goffman, is on the right. And on the bottom, iconic leaders in the field, Zelig Harris and his student, Noam Chomsky, and Uriel Weinreich with his student, William LeBove, who was my dissertation supervisor. Uh, Irving Goffman was also one of my professors at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, their pioneering work in the field of linguistics was extraordinary. And those that know the history of this science well enough will appreciate that at the time that Boaz and Sapir and Bloomfield were working, they also had to overcome uh, anti-Semitic discrimination within the academy. It's very easy to lose sight of the fact that Jewish scholars were the victims of discrimination back then, but that was very much the case in the Anthropological Association. And they simply outworked the rest of the scholars in the field. The science that they produced was first rate and they provided the example for underrepresented scholars that followed. We now have excellent work being produced by scholars from diverse backgrounds, but we have the Jewish pioneers in the field to thank for setting that standard. So I wanna begin with a disclaimer because many of the images that I'm gonna be using are for educative purposes. There are some that are problematic but they are all helpful to my attempt to um, try to discuss this issue as thoroughly as I possibly can. So some of the images potentially might be offensive. It's not my intention to offend when I share those things. Um, going all the way back to the beginning of this country, colonization was the circumstance that gave rise to the first linguistic contact. And not only do you see differences in technology in this particular depiction, the sailing ship, the weaponry, the tools, the clothing differences, but from a linguistic point of view, this is one of the first images where you're seeing 
people that speak very different languages coming together for the first time. And prior to colonization, when you look at the linguistic landscape of the United States, many of the indigenous languages uh, are well represented on this map. And you can see that Illinois and Iowa, those languages are in the locations where those states are. Um, Navajo is out to the west. Um, if you look at where the state of Michigan is, you will see other languages, um, you know, Choctaw, Sioux, uh, Apache, others were part of this uh, iconic historical linguistic situation prior to colonization. And so several of the slides that follow this one will look at some of the issues that gave rise to the linguistic transformation where colonization began to displace the indigenous languages that are illustrated in this slide. And we're gonna begin with looking at the early settlement of the Atlantic colonies. Then we'll consider the impact of the industrial revolution on the linguistic transformation in the United States and what colonization from different European countries caused uh, in terms of linguistic uh, diversity. So when you think about um, the settlement of Jamestown and the settlement uh, in, in uh, Plymouth, uh, Plymouth, the, the landing in Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, one of the reasons that the dialects are very different on the Eastern seaboard is that the settlers came from different regions. The Jamestown settlers came from London and the settlers in New, Engl uh, in New England came from Plymouth and Dartmouth and they spoke different British dialects before they came to the United States. And the settlers in Jamestown took this particular route from London to the Canary Islands where they would then replenish. And then the passage across the Atlantic and settling in Jamestown. But the reason that the dialects are different is because they came from different dialect regions in England, right? And we're talking about white populations. So there's not an issue of racial diversity that we're talking about at that point, but there are clear linguistic differences that show up in the regional dialects along the Eastern seaboard. Now, at this point, I'd really like you to pause. And even though I've been talking about the linguistic evolution of the United States, a moment of self-reflection is gonna be very helpful because each of you has a unique linguistic ancestry. For those who like me are slave descendants, you probably won't know who the family members are that first migrated to the United States, nor will you know specifically the languages that they spoke. But many other people that are on the Zoom will be aware of their family heritage and where their ancestors came from on both sides of the family, where they lived, what languages they spoke. And then there's another question. Did you learn the heritage languages of those ancestors that first migrated to the United States. If you didn't, that's actually quite typical. Why? Because so many immigrant families to the United States that came of their own volition recognized that it was beneficial to their children to learn English as quickly as possible. And so that transformation from whatever the heritage language was to English was to try to help the, uh, the ensuing generations become Americans fully integrated into the society as quickly as they possibly could. That tradition is actually beneficial in a lot of the work that I do when I try to help people understand the nature of linguistic profiling and linguistic discrimination. Why? because depending upon the particular family, the ancestors who first arrived speaking a language other than English, chances are they were the object of linguistic discrimination. 
whether they came from Poland or uh, Italy or um, Vietnam or Korea, speaking with an accent as you try to learn English was often the object of ridicule. All right, so the Swedes and the Norwegians that settled in Minnesota were often criticized because of the way that they spoke and um, seldom did families actually encourage their children to preserve the heritage language. The country would look very different if we had done that. In the context of the global economy, the United States would be far better off if families recognized, yes, you need to learn English, but let's hang on to that German or Italian or Japanese or Chinese, right? Now, because of the constant influx of Spanish speakers, the perception that Spanish somehow threatens English, which is wrong, uh, is, is enhanced by virtue of the fact that Spanish speakers are still coming to the country in both documented and undocumented ways, right? So if you speak a language other than English, you'll also know whether or not English was your mother tongue or was it a language other than English. But every person's individual linguistic journey is relevant to the story that I wanna share. And this, these are pictures of the groups that were attracted to life in America from around the world. You're all aware of the history of the Statue of Liberty and the call for immigrants to come and build this nation. Again, slaves came through a very different set of circumstances. And also the fact that there were uh, important wars that had linguistic consequences uh, should not be overlooked. So in the upper left hand, there's the iconic image of the Revolutionary War throwing off British colonization. These are not in temporal sequence. So next to that is Custer's last stand at Little Bighorn. Next to that is the Civil War. Right below that is Andrew Jackson and the Battle of New Orleans. And then the black and white photo is of Teddy Roosevelt in Cuba with the Rough Riders and their famous ascent of San Juan Hill. All of these battles had linguistic consequences in one way or the other. And I'd like to now shift gears and talk about the unique linguistic heritage of enslaved Americans. And my forefathers and foremothers that came from Africa, not of their own volition, but on slave ships. And this map is important for several reasons, not the least of which reminding us that the majority of African slaves actually went to Brazil. They did not come to North America. And so the slave trade, which was extremely lucrative, and the Dutch slave traders talked about the fact that there was an economic triangle, their ships would leave Holland, would capture slaves, would take the slaves to the new world, would sell them. They would then get sugar, spices, tobacco, and take that back to Europe and became very lucrative. If you're of a certain age, you remember the Dutch master's cigars. Those Dutch master's cigars grew out of the slave trade as did the enormous wealth that still is uh, evident in Holland today. And so with slavery, we found a new set of linguistic circumstances. And this particular drawing implies uh, a false narrative. And the false narrative is that somehow this family is being sold together. That need not be the case. I would ask any parent and especially any mother who's watching this presentation to imagine a situation where one of your babies could be sold as property and you would never see that child again. If you think about that seriously, you recognize the horrors of slavery and that it should never be whitewashed or that it should never be seen as somehow 
uh, a benefit to those who were enslaved. Slavery remains one of the greatest crimes throughout humanity and its consequences are still being felt in the United States today. Now, I'm gonna to shift the gears a little bit and talk about some of the linguistic research because thanks to William LaBeouf, even though many of the social sciences study minority groups, those minority groups are often marginalized. Thanks to the work that William LaBeouf did early in his formulation of variable rules in sociolinguistics, the study of African-Americans has been at the core foundation of global sociolinguistics since its inception. And that was an extraordinary vision, an extraordinary set of circumstances, and his contribution set the stage for the rest of the field. William Stewart, who was a contemporary of Professor LaBeouf, was one of the first to strongly emphasize the African origins of many of the dialect features that we see in contemporary African-American vernacular English. And Walt Wolfram uh, conducted a study of Detroit Negro English in 1969 that was greatly influenced by the work of LaBeouf. Those white scholars provided a roadmap that was then followed by African-American leaders in the field, beginning with Geneva Smitherman, who taught for many years at Michigan State University. My classmate, John Rickford at Stanford University with his son, Russell, wrote a wonderful book called Spoken Soul. It actually won the American Book Award. And another contemporary of ours, Arthur Spears, developed some important uh, linguistic concepts. And Arthur Spears is a graduate of the UC San Diego Department of Linguistics. He is a theoretical linguist and developed a theory growing out of the concept of camouflage forms. I know I'm getting into the linguistic weeds a little bit too deeply here, but I will. Uh, Lisa Green is the youngest theoretical African-American linguist, and she's produced some of the most important work looking at not only the linguistic structures, but the acquisition of African-American vernacular English among children, primarily in Louisiana. And so here's some brief examples. One is the use of habitual be, as in a sentence like they be jumping, we be dancing. That means that usage of be means that the verb happens all the time. This is a habitual event. It's not a singular momentary uh, episode. John Rickford was the first to study the significance of stress having being phonemic. What that means is that stress on the word alone is enough to change its meaning. And if you look at the two sentences, the first one, she been married, means that she used to be married, but she's not married now. But if you put heavy stress on the word been and you say, oh, she been married, not only does it mean that she is currently married, she's been married for a long time. I could go into much more detail about why that's significant, but Rickford's discovery was a huge breakthrough. Uh, copula variability was actually the first place where variable rules in linguistics were studied, but it's because that present tense marker is often not, uh, not used by African-Americans. So he happy or we talking is quite common as opposed to the standard English uses of full is or contracted s or full r or contracted r. I was lucky enough, thanks to the help of um, William LeBeau's son, Simon, who pointed out to me that this usage of steady was something that he had never heard before. I thought steady was just like ain't, right? I knew it was non-standard, but I thought that it was something that white people said. And Simon said, no, I've never heard this before. So it actually led to one of my very first study studies. And what this means is he be steady running means he's running persistently, intensely. You can also use steady in sentence final position with heavy stress. So he be running steady means the exact same thing in a different syntactic location. And the last, there's many, many more examples, but one of my favorites of all time 
came from LaBeouf's Harlem research where one of his informants said, it ain't no cat can't get no coop. Back then in Harlem, uh, a lot of the young men kept pigeons on their roof in coops. And this sentence was stated in response to what about cats getting into the coop? It ain't no cat can't get no coop. Perfectly logical, understandable. All right, but what's misunderstood is the Ebonics controversy. Robert Williams, the late professor of psychology at Washington University in St. Louis, was the person who coined this term. And at the time he coined it in 1973, there were no African-American linguists with PhDs. I was in graduate school, John Rickford was in graduate school, but at that particular time, there were no African-American linguists. And as a psychologist, one of the things that Professor Williams was contemplating was the bigger picture of the African slave trade, right? It, it isn't that slaves were just brought to the United States and exposed to English. And so what, what was the bigger picture? Well, a lot of people don't realize this, but the term Ebonics is used to describe the entire linguistic uh, landscape for the African slave trade. So what you can see on this slide is that Ebonics in Brazil was in contact with Portuguese. Ebonics in Haiti was in contact with French. Ebonics in the Dominican Republic, Spanish, Jamaica, English. And so the European contact, depending upon where the slaves were taken, was very, very different. And Williams' attempt to combine ebony with phonics looks at this international situation, not just the linguistic situation in the United States that eventually gave rise to inferior segregated education until 1954. And then even after 1954, the schools were segregated and not providing equal educational opportunities. Nevertheless, African-Americans were striving to improve their circumstances and conditions, and that had linguistic consequences as well. And as a result of that, you find that there's a linguistic continuum that grows out of the special circumstances affecting the individual African-American that you're speaking with. When they were born, where they live, their own identity, what their aspirations are, and what this model shows is that the vast majority of speakers of African-American vernacular English primarily live, work, and play with fellow African-Americans, for the most part from the working class. But it's possible to move along this continuum towards standard English. And in fact, it's a reflection to a certain extent of my own life journey from having lived in Brooklyn born in Brooklyn Hospital at Flatbush and DeKalb, moving to an inner city black community in Philadelphia, eventually moving to a multiracial neighborhood in Los Angeles, then out to the suburbs in the San Fernando Valley. By the time I was a professor at Stanford University, I had very limited day-to-day -day contact with other African-Americans. And this dynamic is one that shows a tremendous amount of linguistic diversity among African-Americans, and it's a fluid situation. It's not one that's static or in any way constrained. Thinking about the other linguistic circumstances that affected other groups, we see that the colonization that took place uh, by the French as well as the Spanish resulted in large territories that weren't only influenced by English. In addition to the fact that the settlement, the westward settlement of the United States coincided with the Industrial Revolution, which influenced the rapidness with which linguistic change could take place. Remember the original 13 colonies were established at a time when the best way that you could get around was by horse and buggy, right? But once, once steam engines were invented and larger sailing ships, um, that westward movement took place far more rapidly. And some of the iconic events that really did begin to transform the country 
was the Louisiana Purchase impacting with France. Andrew Jackson, displacement of the Cherokee Nation from the Carolinas to Oklahoma, the Trail of Tears where thousands died through that displacement. The Tennessee Volunteers that had the Battle of the Al Alamo over Texas where Spanish and English were on a collision course. And then the Gold Rush in California resulted in this mad dash to the West Coast where the settlement of the country in between took on a very different look than might have otherwise been the case. And so when we think about the displacement of these indigenous populations, that westward movement resulted in the decline and elimination effectively of so many of the indigenous languages that I pointed out previously. But Spanish, uh, the, the, the colonization uh, from the King of Spain was quite substantial as you can see here in 1819, the amount of, ter the amount of territory where Spanish speaking uh, uh, conquistadors were dominating the political and, and social circumstances was quite substantial. And as a result of that, we found a situation where the perception of enemies to the nation was really relative for Many indigenous people, Geronimo and Sitting Bull, were freedom fighters. The same can be said about Francisco Villa, Pancho Villa. Um, but they were perceived to be enemies of the United States, and as such, rewards were put out for them. Now, at this point, I'd like to shift gears slightly and share um, a couple of videos where linguistic and cultural stereotypes are quite evident. people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country and some people don't people start pollution people can stop it right for pollution booklet box 1771 radio city station new york So before I move on to the next slide, uh, the first slide, um, uh, Chief Iron, Iron Horse was not uh, a Native American. The actor that portrayed him was actually of Italian descent, but in Hollywood, he got so many jobs as an actor playing a Native American that he actually pretended that he was a Native American for the rest of his acting career until he passed away. The Granny Goose commercial uh, embodies some of the worst potential stereotypes of the Mexican bandito. Uh, I know that they were trying to be humorous, but you know, advertisers in the United States at different points have been far than sensitive to the linguistic circumstances or the plight of minority populations that were that were suffering. And along those lines, 
we see that other populations also suffered tremendously uh, as they came to this country. Everyone knows that the railroads would not have been built, but for the Chinese laborers that you see illustrated in the upper right. And at the time that the iconic Chinese laundries were in abundance on the West Coast, in San Francisco and Los Angeles, the labor that was associated with cleaning clothes was some of the hardest work that you could ever do. Uh, I don't have an image presented here, but if you remember the iconic image of the railroads coming together to drive in that last spike in Utah, when the crews from the east and the crews from the west met, there are no Chinese depicted in the photograph at that moment, which was exceedingly racist because the Chinese laborers were the ones that were put on the most dangerous jobs. More Chinese died in the building of the railroad from the Pacific than whites by any means. The dynamiting of tunnels and their mistreatment, which is depicted in the cartoon in the upper left, is legendary and unfortunate. What's worse, they're not the only people of Asian descent to be discriminated against. During World War II, we had internment camps where many of my classmates that you saw in the elementary school picture, their parents, and many of my classmates, their parents, were taken to these internment camps. Japanese Americans lost their property, lost their businesses, and were forced to live in these concentration camp conditions until the end of the war. It's worth pointing out that we were also at war with Germany, and to the best of my knowledge, there were no German concentration camps for German Americans. This was explicitly and overtly racist, and the consequences for many of these Japanese American families were devastating. It's not just a linguistic issue, it's a racial issue as well. But when we look at the linguistic landscape of the United States, what we see over time is a tremendously diverse population. talk to one another defines who we are. Damn. And American English is as rich, diverse, and lively as Americans themselves. <laughs> From north to south. I'm near 65 when I started, okay? East to west. I say like Mike and do every other word. <laughs> We love to talk. Is there somebody else that I could talk to? Yeah. Uh, Dish. And chew the fat. It's not a fur piece of rabbit. It's clear that you are what you speak. Isn't this not in my vocabulary? The word is ate. So butter my butt and call me a biscuit. And sit tight as we answer the burning question. Do you speak American? And the reason the documentary was so powerful at the time that it was first, uh, when it first came out, is because so many different Americans could identify with a lot of the regional and ethnic dialects that were on display there. Um, as we fast forward to the future, though, and think about recent events, there's a lot to contemplate. And uh, as I get older and think about the very special circumstances that affected us during the past year, many of which are depicted in this illustration, um, I'm concerned, right? E pluribus unum is on the money, but is that really the case for those of us that live within the United States? Uh, I hope so, and with your help, I hope that as we move toward the future, we'll have opportunities to reunite the people and the states of America. For those of you that are not from San Diego that are on the Zoom, uh, these are two iconic images from San Diego. 
The one on the left is the Hotel Del Coronado in Coronado Island. It's one of the oldest classical hotels in the United States. When the Queen of England stays in San Diego, that's where she stays. If you have a chance to go there, do so. It's opulent, it's elegant, it's quite nice. And then there's the Arboretum in Balboa Park, depicted on the other side. Balboa Park is one of San Diego's most visible landmarks. And I know a lot of this because having grown up in Los Angeles, San Diego was one of the favorite places that we would go to get away on the weekends. I wanna thank you for your time and your attention and especially again to those at the Design Lab for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Baugh, for that really important talk. I think uh, always important, but especially timely given all the things that are happening in the US right now. Um, we had a few questions come in, so I'd like to start to field those for you if that's all right. All right, so we have one question um, that came early early in the presentation. Does this form of linguistic scripting allow for changes in tonality um, more common in Eastern languages? Um, that's a great question. And it depends on a lot of things. I'm not trying to hedge it. So can you read the question again? Sure. Uh, does this form of linguistic scripting allow for changes in tonality? Uh, and then in parentheses, more common in Eastern languages. Right. So English is not a tone language. Um, several of the languages, I mean, now Chinese is a tone language, right? So depending upon the tone that's being used, the same word will have a different meaning. Um, the closest thing that I presented to tone in this presentation grew out of John Rickford's study on the use of stressed bin. And what we think happened there is that some of the African languages, which are tone languages, uh, were spoken by the slaves before they were exposed to English. Well, the slaves didn't have the benefit of going to school. And so as they were learning English, uh, Professor Rickford's, Rickford's work might suggest that tone was actually being integrated into the acquisition of English. And that's, you know, really quite fascinating. So we have some evidence that, that English is absorbing tone, but, but English itself is not a tone language. We also had a few comments that come in. Um, this one is from uh, William and Jillian. The story of Spanish in the US is not all that of immigration since until the Alamo, Spanish was the language in Texas and many of their descendants are still there. Great talk, John. This is Jillian, so happy what you said about Bill. Thank you. Let's see. Um, and then also from Jillian Bill, uh, regarding the Native Americans, Key Largo is super cringeworthy. Great talk, John, thank you. Okay, I happen to see Anna Celia raise her hand. I don't know if she can get a question in. Yeah, for sure. And You're please muted. Go Okay, yeah, free on mute. John, te botaste. You, you threw the ball out of the park. Um, excellent talk. I want to say that this is so timely because International Mother Language Day is coming up on February 21st. And um, I'm organizing a major Zoom uh, meeting for that uh, for UCSD. And last year we had a much, much broader um, celebration all through San Diego. Um, but this talk is uh, what we need to hear on uh, that day. And I think uh, that uh, your um, examples are, are really wonderful. So I was very happy to, to see that. And um, I'm glad that you pointed out uh, the enormous debt that we owe to the uh, Jewish scholars who did uh, that uh, tremendous work. And I know that you and I um, 
benefited me in the South Bronx and you in Philly uh, and later in LA, uh, being part of very diverse um, student groups and communities. And so uh, I think that that's what probably set us on the road to being uh, linguists. And I'm hoping that uh, the people who are listening to this will think about their own linguistic trajectory and um, appreciate uh, the enormous contribution that all of these different languages and speakers have made to the United States. Gracias. Y usted también. Muchas gracias. We have another question. Um, do you have any suggestions about how to combat linguistic profiling? Yeah, it's, it's a two-sided story, right? So on the one hand, uh, I want to call out uh, a fake industry, and it's the so-called uh, accent reduction industry, right? There's a lot of people that hang shingles and they're like, oh, are you an immigrant? Uh, do you speak with an accent? Do you want to get rid of your accent? Just, you know, come study with me and I'll help you get rid of it. Well, you know, what I have to say to that is if Henry Kissinger can become Secretary of State and Arnold Schwarzenegger can become Governor of California, then how about most of us actually trying to be a little more accepting of the linguistic diversity that I showed near the end, right? Um, the United States has always had a lot of different accents but the issue of who gets discriminated against, it's, it's often a surrogate for race or class or other things. Uh, there are regional differences as well. I often ask my students to go through a thought experiment pretending that there is no racial diversity in the United States. Everyone is of European descent. And I ask, would there still be linguistic discrimination? And people say, absolutely. Uh, Southern white Southerners and New Yorkers might not like the way they talk even if they're in the same racial background, there would be class differences, urban versus rural. So the two sides are that people who are in positions of linguistic privilege, we've often talked about white privilege, there's also linguistic privilege. Native speakers of standard English in the United States are in a position of linguistic privilege. If you recognize that, and you put forth the effort to do your best to be accepting of someone whose linguistic background is different from your own, that helps solve a lot of it. And on the other side, you know, I want the people that have been the victims of linguistic discrimination to know that it's not fair, but it's also not incumbent upon you alone to be the source of linguistic change. Thanks for that. Another question, I'm wondering if Dr. Baugh has thoughts on profiling of written accents as in the way folks write in ways that quote, reveal their mother language and whether we can reduce linguistic profiling and how we read and judge writing products. So that's a very interesting and important question. Um, from time to time, I serve as an expert witness in cases where uh, different linguistic issues come up. And very often, one of the controversial areas of forensic linguistics has to do with author identification. One of the, there was a movie that was made about the Ted Bundy case. Uh, I mean, Ted Kaczynski, uh, Ted Bundy too, but Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, and the fact that the Unabomber was identified through the writing of his manifesto. Um, very often, there can be traces of a person's linguistic background that shows up in their writing, but depending upon the evidence, it's not always a slam dunk to determine authorship in writing. In one of the cases that I worked on, uh, a man was, uh, who was African-American did have some of the linguistic features that I talked about. So for example, in the writing, he would say that we be doing things or other things that in the writing. So I was able to confirm that the author was in all likelihood an African-American, but I couldn't say which specific African-American wrote that phrase. So there, there are some things you can identify from writing, but 
it's often very difficult to identify the specific writer of a text message or you know a threatening bank note. Thanks. Uh, another question: Will the U.S. ever become quote accentless? And if so, what accent would that be? Uh, the answer is no. It's not going to become accentless. And uh, it's it's a fair question. For years and years, people just assumed that with the advent of television, uh, radio and television, that linguistic homogenization would take place. But you talk very much like the people that you interact with in your day-to-day -day life. And as a result of that, that's how the accents, regional accents get perpetuated. Um, also, uh, you may be reading questions, but I see somebody with their hand up uh, on my screen and don't know if you wanna- Hello, maybe that's me? Yeah, William Scott. Yeah, thank you very much for the excellent talk. Um, I just had a quick question for you about African American English. Um, it seems unlikely to me that there is a singular African American English or even the spectrum where you have sort of whatever standard American English on one end and African American English on the other. It would seem to me that there would be um, regional variation perhaps or be even very, I mean, if this could be traced going back to the slave trade, depending on the um, linguistic backgrounds from what area of Africa and what language community they were coming from. I was just curious if there is um, studies on variations of so-called African-American Englishes or Englishes traditionally spoken by African-Americans in the United States. Yeah, so you're, it's a great question and, um, the answer is yes to an extent, but uh, it's less pervasive than you might imagine, right? So at one iteration, what you find is when slaves begin to leave the South because of the Industrial Revolution, right? And you're finding Black communities in Chicago and New York and Boston and Detroit, there was racial segregation there. And so to a certain extent, there's some linguistic fossilization where you still see the use of be and ain't and other things. But as there's a social stratification, as people get more education, they are influenced by those local norms. There's another dimension of this that you didn't bring up, but which is relevant, which is the fact that uh, at that time, when you have Jim Crow and explicit overt racial segregation, the voluntary immigration from, by blacks from other parts of the world was really quite limited. And once the civil rights movement was more successful in the United States, you then started seeing more and more people of African descent moving to the United States from Brazil, from Africa, from other parts of the Caribbean. They called themselves African-Americans. When we start talking about African-American English and you take someone like Barack Obama, who's African-American, but who doesn't trace his linguistic ancestry to slaved, enslaved Americans in any way, you're looking at a much more complicated linguistic picture. And the term African-American vernacular English actually becomes inadequate because what I've been talking about for most of this presentation is a vernacular dialect spoken by slave descendants of United States slave descendants whose ancestors came from Africa, right? And that's a very different population altogether. But your point is well taken that even if you look at the slave descendant population by itself, if the slave descendants went to Seattle, if they went to Los Angeles, if they went to Chicago, if they went to Boston, the more educated they are, the more that that vernacular dialect starts to get influenced by local regional norms. Thank you very much. Dr. Ball, we had a few more questions come in, but I also want to respect your time seeing that it's uh, now 5 p.m. So thanks everybody for the questions. And also there were some comments, just thank you. Uh, lots to think about a very worthwhile hour. So um, with that, I just, you know, want to give Dr. Just say anybody that really if you have questions you want to follow up please email me and honestly I want to thank you as well because 
I think it's important for people like you and me to acknowledge the uh, important contributions that, that the Jewish scholars made, and it's often overlooked. And, um, you know, we're so often, you know, called upon to speak for our own groups that the humanity that I know that grows out of your work, right? I mean, you've done very, very much on issues of bilingualism, but your work hasn't been limited to only helping speakers of Spanish. You know, the countless numbers of immigrants from other language backgrounds have been benefited tremendously from that work. And similarly for me, you know, um, uh, one of the things that didn't come up in my talk today is um, the amount of work that I do on stereotypes associated with sexual orientation. One of the biggest dimensions of linguistic profiling has to do with stereotypes about who sounds gay. And that's very, very tough stuff because it turns out that your sexual orientation is not a protected class. National origin, race, age, those are protected classes, but sexual orientation is not. And so for those who are transgender and linguistic issues come into play, we still have a lot of work to do. Thanks so much, Dr. Ba. Um, I wish we were in person to give a, a big round of applause, but I'll do so virtually. Um, thank you all so much and thank you for the engagement. I think this has given us a lot to think about. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank all of you. Thank you. Take care.